Hi, so this is the first video tutorial in the Summer Crash Course series. And like any class, um, for you at least, this might start off pit pitifully simple. And hopefully as it goes, you'll find more interesting material if this is totally review for you. Um, anyway, but this is just some basic stats lingo. So we're all on the same page before I start the regression material. Some tips, um, take some notes. I find I learn much better if I take notes. Um, I know I've audited classes in the past where I got either got nothing out of the class because I just sat there watching or in the classes where I actually took notes and reviewed the materials, I got more out of it. And I'm hoping, you know, the, the, the things you learn here are things that stay with you. So I'm trying to help you do that. And one of the ways I'm doing that is I will give you a few questions at the end so you can Use those to review what you've learned um, during the short lecture. So the goal, again, of this one is to learn a few statistics terms. And as I said earlier, this is so that when I cover the linear model, I can use different statistical terminology to de describe things like the quality of the uh, parameter estimates that we get. All right, and all of this revolves around applying models to our data. Um, models help us tell stories. So I could just plot my data. So here, these are just made up uh, data points, but I have data where I've collected reaction time for some task, and I also have the subject's age. And just eyeballing it looks like, well, the older subjects have longer reaction times. But if I can fit a model to that, um, which I'm showing here, this linear regression uh, line here, the pink line, I now have more information. Um, I, I now have a very specific relationship between age and reaction time, specifically each uh, one year increase in age leads to a 0.16 increase in reaction time. And furthermore, we have these things called p-values that we can assign to these estimates that give us further information about you know, how we feel about these parameter estimates. Are they important? Are they really kind of equivalent? No, well, I can't say equivalent to zero, but can we conclude that they're different from zero? basically. So that's all coming. Um, that's, this is where, this is our goal is to get to all the pieces in this, this picture here. So the statistical terms I'll be using, of course, probability. Um, it's just the expected relative frequency of a particular outcome. So um, for example, if you have a fair coin and you flip the coin a ton of times, uh, the probability that you get a heads is 0.5, meaning half of the time you will get a heads. That's a discrete distribution. So you can also have continuous distributions, for example, height. Um, if I have a distribution of heights and I want to know the probability that someone is, my, is taller than me, I could just look at the probability that height is greater than 69 inches and get that at 0.3. I made that up. I don't know if, I don't think I'm I don't think that's that absurdly tall, but anyway, you get the idea. And this is a continuous distribution. So this one's continuous because height can be any height along a continuum, discrete because uh, a coin has either a heads or tails outcome. So statistical terms, uh, random variable. And this is simply a variable determined by random experiment. So as I showed in the previous example, height was the random variable, and I can compute the probability that a given height is larger than height, or the probability of being larger than some observed height, h. And there's a probability distribution associated with it. It's typically a lowercase letter, something like f of h. It describes the distribution of a random variable. And uh, shorthand for probability distribution function is PDF. And the area under the PDF gives probability. So here, the probability of being larger than where this um, threshold here is, is uh, this area shown here in green. So the area is the probability. So I remember when I started uh, studying statistics, my very first statistics book had all of these distributions in the inside cover and I immediately, maybe I was being ridiculous, I kind of freaked out. I was like, whoa, there are a lot of probability distributions. How do I know when to use which one? Like, which one do I use? 
And it turns out, rest assured, it kind of just comes from however you develop the statistic, and we're going to see that with the GLM. Perhaps you already know we end up running a t-test. Well, I'll explain why we end up using a t-test. And it turns out a lot of these distributions are related to the normal or the Gaussian distribution. So basically, um, a lot of this starts with the Gaussian. Um, so for example, if you have a normally distributed random variable and you square it for some reason, uh, you have something that follows a chi-square distribution. Um, I should say it's a standard normal, but whatever, uh, close enough. And the t, which we will see, involves a normal and a chi-square. It's uh, related to the ratio of those two. And then the f distribution is the ratio of two chi-squares. So you'll see there are various reasons why we end up doing these things, why we end up taking a normal and dividing it by a scaled chi-square, and why we end up taking the ratio of two chi-squares to get an F statistic. So as far as you're concerned, um, don't worry about it too much. Um, I'll always uh, try to explain how we end up at a specific distribution. But, and I'm not going to have time to go a lot into the normal distribution, uh, just a lot of things in nature naturally follow a normal distribution. So if you measure people's heights, they will fall into a bell curve. So this distribution that I showed you here is a normal distribution. It's just this bell curve shape. Um, and lots of other things follow a normal distribution. You can look it up on Wikipedia. I'm sure it has a ton of examples. The expected value is the mean of a random variable. So if I say expected value, or if I ever use this E of and then put a, a random variable in there, um, I'm referring to the mean. So the mean of the distributions typically, well in this case it's the center because it's a symmetric distribution. So expected value. Variance, you've probably heard variance before. That's how the values of your random variable are dispersed about the mean. So it's just the relationship of the data to the mean. The covariance, on the other hand, it's basically a variance, but with two random variables uh, considered at the same time. So how do they vary together? I won't say a lot about the covariance now, but when I talk about time series data analysis for fMRI, I will talk more about uh, covariance and correlation. And uh, I just want to add, if two random variables are independent, independent simply means knowing something about one tells you absolutely nothing about the other. So, for example, knowing where my dog is sleeping in my house right now isn't going to tell you anything about um, how the stock market is doing. So those two things are independent. Um, right. When that happens, the covariance between those two random variables is zero, but the opposite is not true. So you can have a covariance of zero, but that does not ensure your two things are independent. Okay, bias and variance are um, terms that are commonly used to assess an estimator. Let's see, do I explain what an estimator is? Okay, so an estimator, basically if you have something to estimate, say you want to estimate the mean or the expected value or you want to estimate a variance, um, you need an estimator. And it's basically the equation that you dump your data into and then it spits out your answer, your parameter, your mean or your variance or your regression slope or your regression intercept. And that's an estimator. So. The terminology bias and variance, here variance is, has a slightly different meaning, um, can be used. Bias means that on average your estimate's correct, and variance has to do with the reliability of the estimate. And again, an estimator is something that estimates a parameter for you. So this is how we quantify the quality of our estimator. So, um, we have these four different scenarios I'm showing here. We're going to start with this um, upper left hand. High bias, low variance. So let me explain what the, the points are in the bullseye. The center of the bullseye, is, that's the truth. We don't know the truth, but our goal is to uh, hit the bullseye. The points are estimates from independent data points that we've dumped into our estimator and the estimator has spit out. So this high bias, low variance estimator 
gives us estimates that are low variance because all the estimates are very similar to each other, but it's high bias because we're really missing the target. So this is typically um, not a good place to be. It's not as bad as high bias, high variance. Um, in this case, not only are you missing the bullseye, but your, your estimates are not highly related to each other. We would love to be here. We would love to be in this low bias, low variance situation where we hit the bullseye and we always hit the bullseye. But um, not to, to uh, spoil anything, we're very rarely here. We're typically here. This low bias, high variance case. Low bias because on average, we would hit the bullseye. But any single study, uh, the estimates from various independent data sets will be highly variable. Um, the reason why this is typically where we are is because we can actually move our data toward the bullseye, typically, if we can somehow increase the sample sizes of the data that we're dumping into our estimator. Um, I, won't, well, I won't be talking about it for a while if I do it all, but there are cases actually where we, on purpose, bias our estimates in order to reduce the variance. So sometimes you get into the situations where the variance is so bad that you have to do something. And that something is you bias the estimates in order to reduce the variance and hopefully get something out of the data. Uh, that's what ridge regression and the lasso do. They both bias the estimates toward zero. So what's better, low bias, low variance, you know, really matters. We, t we typically want both. But generally I would say uh, low bias is better. But uh, and a lot of the things we work with, you'll see, are unbiased. And right, I already mentioned that sometimes the variance is so out of control that we sacrifice a little bias to fix the variance. When I talk about collinearity, this will probably come up. And again, ridge regression and the lasso or lasso, depending on where you live, um, are used for this. That's it. Not a lot of terminology, like I said. Um, here are the things you should know by now. You should know what a mean is or an expected value. You shouldn't be tripped up if I say expected value instead of mean. And you should know what a variance and what covariance are. Uh, what does it mean if your estimator is unbiased? Likewise, what does it mean if your estimator has low variance? And what kind of estimator would you like to have? Would you rather it have no bias, no variance, or, well, of course, both, but we're not going to have that. So second best option. Thanks. Um, that's all I have for now. The next time I'm going to start the general linear model with simple linear regression. So please um, leave some comments if you want, either here on the YouTube channel, um, on the Facebook. If you haven't already liked it, please go to the Mumford Brain Stats Facebook page. And there's also Twitter and there's the Tumblr. So uh, that's how you can uh, stay tuned with what's going on here. So yeah, thanks for your attention. Oh, sorry. And next time, little teaser, we're going to learn about blue. And we will answer the question, is a blue estimator a sad estimator? That's it. All right. See you later.